I think, oh, I think when the internet died, <laughs> yeah. I was talking about being in, um, in graduate school. So I went back to school so that I could refocus on my studio art practice. And it's like not just calligraphy that I'm interested in. It's, it's like using calligraphy to approach ecology and oh, yeah. to approach like a language from a decent well human language as a decentralized concept and you know i have all of these sort of lofty but very grounded ideals that i wanted to explore with that and um that's i guess that's like my niche which is a pretty normal thing to have as a visual artist and in the art world of today artists are really encouraged to to sort of find that niche and um What's yeah. the word? Exploit it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, but also explore it. Also explore it. Right. Well, what do you? What are those lofty ideals that you're talking about? Like, what are what are you what are you trying to do with that? I mean, completely destabilize the system as it is. Like, yeah. Um, I well, one of the reasons that I've been enjoying your work so much is that you have so many interesting uh, leftists on mm -hmm. and I've been influenced by um, like anarcho-primitivist theory and thought and uh, all, sor all sorts of good stuff for a very long time. And I, I, I think I'm trying to reckon with some of that uh, through, well, it's in my work, it's like poetry, but it's also the inclusion of some of this theory and the way that this theory sort of gets explained both in the like the oral tradition, but also down on the page. Um, mm. And then, you know, the power of visual art is to take these things that are a little bit hard to wrap one's head around or are difficult to say in a simple phrase and make that sort of visible, even if not fully um, legible as an image. And then of course we have incredible visual processing ability as humans. Mm -hmm. So it's like leaning into, leaning into all of the meaning that happens outside of our language, but using language as like a kind of primary focus point. So the ideals have to do with, yeah, I mean, it's anti-system, it's anti-capitalism, yeah. it's, um, and it's not just anti, there's sort of this feeling that there's something to stand for and not just against. Like I call my, my paintings um, Gaia Illuminations. Mm. It's a shorthand I came up with yeah. when I was in school. Um, I'm not like a devotee of the deity Gaia, mm. mm -hmm. <laughs> but it was like sort of, are you familiar with James Lovelock? Yeah. The Gaia, uh, Gaia. Yeah, the Gaia hypothesis. Yeah. So it was sort of referencing that and letting it be something that wanted to be both mythic and um, I guess like even empirical at the same time. Mm. Okay. Does that make sense? I think so. I mean, <laughs> I'm just I wanna... a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, well, it's maybe, I think that this is interesting because I think language is such a, It's like either you approach it, like when I think of calligraphy and I think of this sort of classic idea of, of taking the written word and artistically representing it, you know, I think of these old tomes with this incredible, you know, like, like one of the, my favorite things I saw when I, I went to, um, I was talking to my, my partner about this the other day. I went to, I was talking about how I went to, when I was in New York last it was years and years ago but i went with uh, my sister we went to the met mm -hmm. and uh, and i was just explaining like being almost sensorily sensorily overloaded walking in there because there's like you're like you're standing in front of these like incredible works of art but there's so many of them mm -hmm. and you can't really appreciate something when there's so much of something it's like you're standing in front of like i saw some paintings i really wanted to see but it was like crowded around with a bunch of other and it was just too much and uh but there was one section of the of the met which was middle eastern uh art and so there were oh yeah their illuminated manuscripts are incredible yeah yeah exactly and i didn't know that that would be there i just i think it was one of the first um rooms or areas that we just walked into and 
and yeah, it was like standing in front of something that I felt was the illum- the illuminated manuscripts. There were just these like Arabic from like the 16th century or something, these giant books. And, um, you know, I can understand the sacredness of the written word when there's that much intention and thought put mm-hmm. into producing something like that. Um, but at the same time, there's something about the written word. It defines and categorizes the world, our reality in such a way that it actually can desacralize or, or not even really profane, but, but, you know, it turns something into a, an idea that's contained within a definition and so there's this contradictory aspect when I think of, you said, anarcho- anarcho-primitivist and you're thinking about, well, where was the turn when human beings started to become what they are today? Some people go back to the beginning of agriculture. You know, there's always there, the industrial revolution more freak, more recently. Uh, but then you have like John Zerzan, who's like, well, it was when human beings started to symbolize the world around them and started to like orally and then write down the things they understood and started to categorize things. And of course now we're in the, this techno industrial civilization and it's just gone to this extreme end of that. And so I, I've just, I just, I guess when you're talking about these things, it's fascinating, like how you play, maybe I am putting you in a box by trying to ask you these questions in this way. But I, when I think about it, I'm like, how do you take something as I, I think calligraphy is incredibly beautiful and I appreciate it when I see it. But something about writing words can, uh, it puts it down on paper. It makes it a definable thing when it seems it like fixes you're... it. It yeah. fixes it in place. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, a lot of what you're saying really resonates because these are the ideas that excite me. Like, yeah. Um, the, yeah, when it's written down, it's both fixed in place and it sort of stops time. It can't change. It can't evolve. It can't respond. It can't shift. It's not really a living word. Mm-hmm. That, that's a completely valid argument. I think that's some of what I want to rail against, I guess. I mean, also a lot of the words that are being so carefully written and gilded and painted and decorated you know they're rooted in our in monotheism they're rooted in sort of Mm. like this is the way we look at the world this is the right way there's Mm. this sort of singularity that they're trying to proclaim and i'm not i'm not into that either yeah yeah (laughs) and like um so there's like a lot about that modality that is working against a lot of what i feel very passionate and interested in. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but I guess well, so for, for my work, there's this constant um, bleeding out into the organic or into the texture or into the material that I'm using. And so I play with that in my paintings. Like you can read the line and then you can't. It sort of drops mm-hmm. off of the legible and becomes sort of greater than our ability to read. I was really influenced by this book, The Spell of the Sensuous, by David Abrams Mm -hmm. in grad school. And, um, well, actually about like seven eighths of the book, because then I got to the end and it felt like somebody told him he had to put it into a package at the end and tell Uh, you what you thought about all of the cool things he had written. Sure. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the book, but it's awesome. I've heard of it. I haven't read it, but I've heard good highly things. recommended, but okay. he was talking about that um, in that whole book uh, of studying magic all over the world with shamans and magicians and just being this like weirdo who wanted to travel <laughs> and learn magic tricks and then sort of coming to understanding that the sensuous is language upon language and that like the little ways that we speak and the ways that we write alphabets have so limited our ability to perceive and understand so much that's out there. And that really moved me, even if his conclusion was meaningless for my thesis. And like Mm -hmm. this concept that there's just so much, you're only ever seeing a tiny snapshot of it anyway. So little human lives are also incapable of reflecting upon um, the immensity and possibility of change and life and meaning so we're only ever getting the same level of 
fixation or snapshot that writing a phrase down does, which is kind of interesting to sort of even think about like a life that way. But I guess I'm pushing against calligraphy's edges and trying to say that there's more it can do but it's also I just enjoy calligraphy and I enjoy language and a way to share language that is beyond the oral is by writing it down and just because things do get written down doesn't mean they need to become written on in stone I guess yeah like there's a beauty to the paper it's a living material it buckles and warps and shrugs off ink and sucks in the ink and it's like yeah you're you're actually sort of dancing with the with the stuff on the table or on the panel well it's a it's a visceral experience is what it sounds like it sounds like the paper and the ink and the pressing the the pen or or whatever it is onto the the paper and it's just this whole i i feel like probably i i, I think we lose a lot without that aspect to it because i enjoy that part of it when i write down and I, there's a good piece of paper that you're writing down on and the with feeling a good of pen. It, with a good <laughs> pen yeah not just some <laughs> shitty bick which is fine for what it is but it's like nothing like having a good pen that has good ink that flows out of it you know it feels mm -hmm. really good yeah the way too that we naturally want to write when, when it's feeling good and you, you want to like keep going with the um flourishes and creating doodles mm -hmm. and extend you're sort of always extending outside of the realm of the written word you're always drawing also so yeah. writing and I mean I've said this a number of times when I've tried to teach calligraphy or teach hand lettering like you're not writing letters you are drawing words there's actually a lot of drawing it's a completely different mind thing I mean, you're using the same motor skills but you're not leaning into your muscle memory of writing grocery lists right so you're making a drawing and then there's a lot more expressiveness and there's a lot more body that's happening when you're recording calligraphy like a drawing you know like this reminds me of i mean just the word poetry or or not the word poetry but the act of making poetry which is it's when you're talking about language and, and I'm thinking about how using the very tool that is limiting to break outside of the constraints of the tool itself. So <laughs> you're like, how can I convey a feeling, a sensation and whole, a whole experience by not actually saying the name of the thing itself, but like exploring the edges of what that is so that by the time you've gone through the, the poem, and it's not just the act of like reading it and the image that comes to your mind. It's the actual shape of the words, the, sh the way that it flows from beginning to end. That whole experience itself draws on a, a sensation, uh, which then produces a, maybe it pulls on a memory or it pulls on something else. Um, and I imagine if you're, if you're like, if you're doing calligraphy, like you're describing, the act, the flourishes, the everything, like looking at that, that'll draw on something as well. It's like within each letter that you're writing down, that you're drawing, that in and of itself is producing an meaning. experience. Yeah, meaning. Because it's yeah. not, it doesn't just mean T or Y or the, <laughs> or all of those letters put together to make a word or a sentence. It's the letter itself is expressing something. Yeah. Yeah. I think in that way, like calligraphic letters become pictograms. Like yeah. they become runes, really. Like yeah. they they become sigildry. Sigildry. And it's like the 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 number of layers that one can actually put into something like that is limitless. Yeah. And that's that's what's exciting. And it's um I think too, when I'm building my paintings, I'm pulling I'm pulling from all sorts of sources my own writing um poetry uh political theory like there's these really interesting weird mashups and sometimes I refer to them almost as a visual essay in like the lyrical essay tradition um because that's what they're doing they're trying to get ideas or modalities or concepts to sit together um very beautifully but in a very messy way mm -hmm. and that's sort of the microcosm 
theory that I have about it. Like calligraphy can be this way of creating a, a microcosm of the whole of Gaia, if you want 